Well, good morning. Happy Reformation Day. Uh, it's Reformation Day in Papua New Guinea. They don't actually have Halloween in Papua New Guinea. Uh, that tradition never made it there. But in the late 1800s, uh, some Lutheran missionaries made it to the shores of Papua New Guinea, and Lutheranism uh, took off there. And so they celebrate Reformation Day there every year uh, instead of Halloween, which is wonderful. Uh, the bad news is, is that over time, sometimes our good traditions can become the only tradition, and we can lose sight of those things that actually matter, lose sight of God's word and what he has actually said. Uh, and that has certainly happened in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, as people who don't have God's written word in their own language uh, begin to just follow the ideas of mankind. Uh, so while they do have a Reformation Day, uh, it's, uh, it, even that needs reforming. Um, and so I'm thankful that you guys sent us to do just that. As many of you know, I'm not one of the preachers here, not one of the pastors here at Grace Bible Church. I am a missionary sent out by you uh, to translate the Bible and plant a church in Papua New Guinea. Uh, seven years ago, uh, you sent out the Cans, the Dodds, and the Laymans uh, to Papua New Guinea, and we've been laboring there ever since. You've since sent the Mitchell family and Amelia Brink as well, uh, and we've been working there uh, for seven years to learn a language and a culture in order to preach God's word carefully and clearly in a language that they can understand. Uh, we're home on furlough for this year, and the, the elders have asked that I just share with you some of what I am learning some of what I'm teaching in the tribe. Uh, just this last year, we were able to start preaching God's word in the Doe language and bringing them from Genesis all the way to Revelation, uh, showing them the truth of who Jesus the Messiah is uh, so that they can believe in him and be saved. And we've been there for uh, seven years now doing that work, and, and just now we're starting to see the fruit of that. Uh, and so it's just... Uh, a privilege to be back with you guys, and I just wanted to take an opportunity on the front end of this sermon to thank you for sending us so well. Um, it has been such an encouragement to Cassidy and I and to our kids and to our teammates as we see you guys faithfully follow the Lord, faithfully reading his word, faithfully trusting him in the midst of shifting circumstances, uh, suffering, temptation. Uh, these things are not uh, Papua New Guinea doesn't have a monopoly on those things. Those things exist here as well. And to see you guys plotting faithfully and following our Savior is just an encouragement to us. It's one of the ways that you send us well. So thank you, uh, Grace Bible Church, for that. For the last two Sundays, we've been in Genesis 5 to 8. We're looking at the story of Noah. Specifically, we want to see who is God? Who is God? Who is this God at the end of the world? And what did God do at the end of the world in Noah's day? So turn with me to Genesis. We'll be starting in chapter 7. Living in Papua New Guinea, we experience lots of earthquakes. It's on the ring of fire. A lot of earthquakes, a lot of landslides. Most of them are small, but so far... Our family has been through two that were over seven on the Richter scale. Our houses are built up on stilts, and so they shake a lot. So whenever there's a large earthquake, we just quickly run outside, because the whole house is just going back and forth, and so we run outside. And I remember after running out of the house one time, I remember we got out of the house, we're standing outside on what's our helicopter pad out there, and we're just looking at our houses, and they're just going back and forth like this. And I could feel the ground moving underneath us. And I, I remember thinking, like, where else do you go? Like, I've run out of the house, but the ground is shaking. Like, where do you go if the ground is shaking? Where do you go if uh, everything around you is collapsing? And sometimes we experience that in a different kind of way, when we experience a deep loss. Maybe the loss of a job or the loss of something that we were hoping for or counting on. 
the loss of an expectation, or painfully, the loss of a loved one. This feeling of, what am I going to do now, can be really intense. Now magnify those realities, that feeling of, what do I do? Magnify that with the end of the world. The end of the world where everything you know comes to an end. When everything else is stripped away in that day, it will just be us and God. That's it. Do you know the God who is going to be there? Do you know where you stand with him? We tend to think of the story of Noah as a children's story, as something meant for Sunday school, or worse, perhaps just something meant for nursery rhymes. But oh, how we should become little children again. These, these stories, they are simple. And there is some simple truth to them. And we should know it. We should believe these words of God and hold fast to the simple truths that are here. Just because they're simple and clear and straightforward does not mean they're unimportant. We need to know the God of the Word. When I, when I preached these sermons originally in the Doe language, I just wanted them to know who God is so that they can know who it is that they're going to meet at the end, so that, they can see th- so that they could see themselves rightly. Why is it that they exist in these mountains, in the jungle, in the middle of nowhere? What, how did they get there? What, what is their condition? And what rescue is provided for them? I think that's why you turn to the story of Noah. And what could be more urgent for you this morning than to know where you stand in relation to the God at the end of the world? So let's, let's take some time to pray that God would not just teach us as we read his word, but that he would change us, that he would give us hope and comfort by showing us who he really is. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we need you. We need clear truth to believe and to hold on to. And we need your help to believe it. Oh God, would you help our unbelief? Would you help us to take our hearts and our minds, whatever we have on our minds right now, that's lesser whatever we have on our minds that's not you, would you help us replace those thoughts with your word as we look to it? Oh God, these people sitting here under the preaching of your word, they don't need just another opinion or perspective. They need your word. They need your opinion and perspective on the end of the world. Oh God, may you help us to really see what you did at the end of the world to see who you really are, so that we might have confidence in you at the end of the world. You were there at the beginning, and you will be there at the end. God, thank you for your patience, that you wait patiently, desiring that none should perish, but that all would reach repentance. And Lord, may your son Jesus bring us safely into that everlasting city where you will be. I ask this in his name. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 7. Uh, as we move through the story of Noah, Genesis 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, we're asking one important question. What did God do at the end of the world? What did God do in Noah's day? Specifically looking at six things that God did. Last week we looked at three, and I'll review those briefly here. Number one, God kept his promises God said that sin would lead to death in Genesis 3, and it did, and still does. God said the ground would be cursed, and that life would be hard, and it was, and still is. And because of that, we who trust God and his word are sorrowful, but always rejoicing. 
sorrowful because this life is hard. We've, we've all experienced it. Sickness, death, losses, conflict, it's all here, and it's painful. And, and that does bring us sorrow. It brings us a sense of grief, but not grief without hope. We can rejoice because the fact that God's word is coming true, he said the ground would be cursed, and it is. The fact that that's coming true is the grounds for our greatest hope, which is that God keeps his promises. And so if he promises a rescue, he's going to send one. This world is not as it should be. Yet at the same time, we trust that the God who made it that way will keep his promise to crush the serpent and make all things new. God said a descendant of the woman would crush the serpent and his destruction... um, God would crush the serpent and his destruction of the wicked. Um, And his preservation of Noah is in keeping with that promise. Everything that God does in this story of Noah is in keeping with the promises that he made. Number two, we saw that God assessed mankind and condemned them. God knows everything and can correctly assess every person and fairly condemn them, justly condemn them. And as we saw and we'll see again today, the proper judgment of God is not a slap on the wrist. Don't do that again. The proper judgment of God is destruction. And in light of that bad news, there is good news. Number three, God provided a rescue. God saves those who believe his word. And God gave a word to Noah. I'm going to destroy the world. So build a boat. And Noah believed that God was telling the truth. So he built a boat. And then when the time had come, God shuts the door, thereby protecting Noah and condemning all outside the ark to death. So that leads us to where we are in the story now, where God destroyed those who rebelled against him. So number four, God destroyed rebels. Let's read it. We're in Genesis chapter 7. I'm going to pick up the story in verse 11. In the, 600, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day, 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, Noah, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. It's at least 21 feet. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So in this account, we clearly see God as having the right and the authority 
and the power to punish sinners. I mean, who, in this story, who is there to stop him? Who is there to question him or counsel him? No one. In our village, some people think that God and Satan are equals in a battle for souls. And that sometimes God has the upper hand and sometimes Satan has the upper hand. But you read stories like this and it's so clarifying to us. Satan and God are not equals. God has no equal. He is holy. He is other. He's the only one not created. He has all power and he does as he pleases. And God does exactly what he said he would do. If he makes a promise, he keeps it. At the allotted time, God ceases his striving with mankind, his patient waiting comes to an end, and he blots them off the face of the earth along with every other living thing on the ground. Anyone not on the ark? God killed them. He covered the entire world in a massive, horrifying flood. Great mountains covered by a greater sea, all of them covered by at least 21 feet of water. This flood was worldwide. Look at what it says. It's not my opinion. This is just God's word. Look at what it says. Verse 19. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. All the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. This is everything that's under the sky. I mean, what's under the sky? Everything that you know, that I know. This is true. And I'll, I'll just do a quick plug right here for uh, a night service that was held at GBC back on May the 23rd of this year, where Dr. Clary of the Institute for Creation Research spoke uh, regarding the dinosaurs and the flood. Um, if you're wondering whether or not there's any evidence that this is true, uh, there is a lot of it. And I highly recommend his brilliant two-hour presentation on how the scientific evidence supports what God has described in the opening chapters of Genesis. Uh, I think if you just go onto the GBC website, and in the little search bar, the way I found it was I just put the word dinosaur in the search bar. <laughs> Hit enter, it should come up. Uh, if it's not, we'll find a way to get a link to you somehow. Um, but listen, the, the truth is true, regardless of other theories and opinions. The truth is true. Um, if all you have is God's word, if we didn't have Dr. Clary's awesome presentation, if all you had was this, you have enough. You have enough to know what actually happened in the past. God doesn't lie. He tells the truth. He says he flooded the world and everyone perished except for Noah. So that's what happened. Notice how many rescues there were at the end of the world in Noah's day. How many were there? How many rescues were there? Just one. Other people could not create their own solutions to the coming judgment. There was no other boat, no other raft, no uncovered mountain peak. Verse 23 says, only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. That was the only rescue. God destroyed all the rebels who were on the earth. All those people that we read about in Genesis 6 last week, mankind, the lovely daughters of men, the sons of God, the Nephilim, the mighty men of old, the men of renown, all of them were destroyed. All of them drowned by the waves of God's judgment. Four times in three verses, God emphasizes that point. We just read them, starting in verse 21. 
Verse 21, all flesh died that moved on the earth, including, at the end of that verse, all mankind. Verse 22, everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. Verse 23, he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. And then the very last sentence, they were blotted out from the earth. God is a righteous judge. He assesses mankind rightly, and he dispenses proper punishment. No one outside of the ark got more than they deserved, and no one got less. In Noah's day, God put his justice on display, and there was no one there to stay his hand or ask him, what have you done? God did it perfectly. Only a small, small remnant was saved. Eight people. Small in number, yet massively important in God's redemptive plan. Massive in, massively important piece of God's faithfulness. For if God had made a complete end of mankind, then what descendant of Eve would there be to destroy the serpent? God has not forgotten his promises. These are weighty things for us to hear. For being a child's story, this is pretty dark. But all of this is so helpful for us. Speaking about the anger of God and the eternity of hell and the punishment of sin is not popular. It's not popular here, and I can tell you it is not popular in our village. Uh, people do not like stories of God's judgment, of God's wrath, of being told that they are sinners, and the, the just punishment for that sin is an eternity in hell. That is not popular. I've talked to so many villagers who told me that um, God's anger was exhausted at the flood, so that they're aware of Genesis. They've, they've heard some of these stories before in their in their Sunday school classes. And they're like, yes, oh yeah, God back in the day, way back then God was angry and destroyed everybody. But God's not that angry anymore. God's, God, he, he exhausted his anger, everything's fine now. And we may, we may scoff at that interpretation. Uh, but I've heard Americans say similar things. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? Especially a hell that involves never-ending conscious torment. The argument usually includes an appeal to 2 Peter 3.9, God desires that none should perish. And listen, the Bible does speak of God's mercy and compassion often. Like, like, like we saw, the, the amount of writing that God dedicates to the rescue itself is way more massive than the amount of writing that he dedicates to the wrath that he poured out on the earth. The rescue is important. The compassion is great. It is glorious. God's great love is vast. It is deep. It is wide. It is long. It is high. Oh, that we would know it. Nothing in all creation can separate a person from the love of God if they have it. This is true and worthy of our greatest admiration, praise, and joy. Brothers and sisters, if you know the love of God, if you know it as it was displayed in God sending his own son to die, and if you believe in that son, then you are safe. Where else could you go to escape judgment? Where else could you go to escape slavery to sin and find adoption into God's own family? Nowhere else. That mercy and compassion and love is amazing. And yet the human heart can so easily distort that love and compassion. What the Bible does not say is that every human being will be saved, that God will show everyone his saving mercy. In Noah's day, only eight people survived the flood. 
And in the Bible, the outlook for future judgment is not good. In the days of Abraham, God picked one family out of all the families that were on the earth. And he did not pick the greatest people. He picked a group small in number. And according to Deuteronomy, he just says, I loved you because I loved you. In Elijah's day, Elijah bemoans that Israel, God's people of promise, have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. It was a lonely time to be a prophet. It's 1 Kings 19.14. And though Elijah was not really the only one, as God reminded him, Still, only a remnant was saved from God's judgment of Israel and its wayward people. And many of you will recall Jesus' words. Think about Jesus' words in light of what we've been saying here. In uh, Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And then there's Jesus' brutal question at the end of the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 7, And will not God give justice to his elect? who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. That's good news. Now listen to this. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God is merciful. And yet the Bible clearly teaches that there are only going to be few who believe. Few will be ready. Few will find the gate. Few will travel the narrow way. Few will be saved. The greatness and the abundance of God's mercy and God's mercy and compassion are great. But it's not measured in how many the Lord saves. The magnitude of his love is not measured in how many. What are the numbers? Did he save a billion, two billion? Wow, that's a lot of love, a lot of compassion. It's measured, God's love is measured by the magnificence of God's holiness, the wretchedness of mankind, and the fact that God saves anybody. That is where we find the glory, the wonder of God's love. I mean, don't you want to know God's love? Don't you want to find that narrow gate? Don't you want to know how to be saved at the end of the world? This brings us right back into the good news. Right back. The next thing we see that God did in Noah's day at the end of the world was God remembered Noah. Let's look at Genesis 8, starting in verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat." Those opening words, God remembered Noah, is not to say that God had forgotten Noah, but rather that God intended to keep his word to Noah. God had made a covenant with him, had made a promise with him, and God is going to keep that promise right on time. Promises that he made to Satan, he's fulfilling. 
Remember he told Satan, a seed of the woman is going to come and crush your head, a fatal wound. And he's keeping promise that he made to Noah back in Genesis 6, 18 to 20. I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. That's a promise, and God is not forgotten. Psalm 105.8 is helpful in this. It says, Yahweh our God remembers his covenant forever. He remembers forever. There is no forgetting with him. This is a divine calling to mind. Things that he wants to accomplish at the proper time. Things not forgotten. God is focusing now. He has just destroyed the world, and now he is focusing his attention on those whom he is saving. And so God causes a wind to blow. God closes the fountains of the deep. He shuts the windows of heaven. God restrains the rain, and so the waters recede from the earth. As you can imagine, this passage is really helpful for people in our our village who are animists, who believe there are ways of controlling the wind and the waves and the rain and floods and landslides. They believe if you just kind of do the right things and manipulate the spirits the right way, you get the results that you want. How instructive to read this and to realize, no, it is God who causes all these things. And notice that God did not just provide Noah with a boat. That is one of the things he provided Noah with. But he provided him with all that was needed to get in and out of the ark. I mean, how do you dry up a wet, covered earth? God knows how to do that. He sends a wind. He stops the rain, stops the deeps from bubbling up. And he lets the waters go down, and he dries out the earth. So that eventually he can command Noah, once again, look at Genesis uh, 8, 15 to 19. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything, on the, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. God provided a successful rescue. A successful rescue for Noah, his family, and the animals on board the ark. The ancient world came and went, and they were still alive. God preserved them. He kept them. So that's the flood story. God destroyed the earth with a flood. So now what? What's changed? Well, the world hasn't changed. Though drastically impacted by the flood and markedly less populated, the ground is still cursed. The flood did not wash that curse away. Death is still a part of the world. Mankind hasn't changed. Noah and his family and their descendants are all still evil from their youth, as we'll read. And if you read the rest of chapter 9, which we're not going to get to this morning, you get a glimpse of the dysfunctional nature of this family. Noah's drinking. Noah's son highlighting his father's shame. Noah cursing one of his grandsons. Everyone's still in need of a rescuer, still in need of a savior, still in need of that descendant of the woman, that promised one, a Messiah to come and rescue them. Chapter 11 finds Noah's descendants rebelling against God's command to fill the earth, building a tower to make a great name for themselves. So mankind is still very much the same as prior to the flood. But perhaps, not perhaps, 
definitely, most important, God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. He is still keeping his word, still the only one worth fearing, still holy, still just, still providing a rescue. He he tells mankind to be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth. By chapter 10, the genealogy picks up again. The genealogies of the Bible, the search for the Messiah continues. So we'll bring our study of Genesis to an end with God's final activity in chapter 8. We started last week looking at chapter 5, how God kept all the promises that he made in Genesis 3. And now here at the end of Genesis 8, we see God making more promises. More promises. Promises that he will keep throughout the history of the world. At the end of the world, God made trustworthy promises. This is Genesis 8, 20 to 22. I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is a promise of God. He knows he's going to be provoked by man's sin. He says, I will never curse the ground again because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. God knows he's going to be provoked to anger. Psalm 711 declares that God is a righteous judge, a God who feels indignation every day. Indignation. He hates sin. And think of how often you sin. And there's how many of you in this room? That's a lot of sin. And I'm in this room. And I sin. That's a lot of indignation. But he will never again strike down every living creature as he had done with a flood. There will not be another flood, and that is exactly what he tells Noah in chapter 9, 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. I remember after I finished the story of Noah, uh, we were just walking through the Bible, right? So we have not gotten to the story of Jesus yet. And I'm just teaching this same stuff and one guy comes running up to me after our meeting and he says, Zach, do you know where this boat is? We, we got to get on it. Uh, or at least build one. Like he was convinced, oh, this has got to be the solution. We need solution. They're always looking for solutions to make their lives bigger, better. And here was his attempt. Let's build a boat. And I said, oh, Lupa, sorry. God says he's never going to destroy the world with a flood again. No, no need for a boat. But there is another rescue. There is another rescue. God promises that as long as the earth remains, the world will sustain life here. There's going to be seed time and harvest. Food is going to grow. Food can be grown. The ground will produce. There will be cold and heat, not just one or the other, thankfully. And the world will keep on spinning. There's going to be day and night as long as the earth remains. And that line at the end of Genesis 8 ought to give us pause. We ought to consider this world will not always remain. It is not eternal. There is a judgment coming. And not just a judgment, but a rescue for all who, like Noah, Believe the word of God. And when the last day comes, God has the power to accomplish his promises of judgment and rescue. This is one of the wonderful things about knowing the God at the end of the world is you can actually trust his power, that his word will come true. 
You can trust that what he says about the way to be saved is the way to be saved and that God actually has the power, the right, and the authority to save you. He has the power. Last week, I I showed you a children's book uh, from our book table back there that highlights how God always keeps his promises. Uh, This week, I want to show you a few pages from a children's book that our team produced for the people of Mairoro. Uh, This book highlights God's great strength. It's called God Has All the Bones. Anituko Wimbing Sosong, God Has All the Bones. Kind of a weird title. But the, the translation of it is literally God is Almighty. God is almighty. Uh, to have bones in dough means to have strength. So saying that God has all the bones means God has all the strength. Uh, and then if, you, uh, if we flip to the part of this story that's about Noah, this is what it says. Imeyate, Noah nimimbo pisiaro. Noah naruko unipare so sombo. O pimi nange te yangurimboro anutuko arara tero rambaruru yerewe yero ingaro. Asa noa samakang owero yuka ku ye mironi sip paraminku towaro. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> I'll translate it for you. After a while, Noah's mother gave birth to him. And in Noah's time, People, all of them, were doing very bad things. And because of that, God was angry and wanted to destroy them. All right, but Noah, he gave a helping talk too. He told them that talk, and Noah built a very large boat. And then flip the page over. It says, God sent water a water that covered everything, a very big covering water that came into being. And people, along with all animals, all of them, drank water and died. God has all the bones. Flip the page. But God, Noah, Noah's wife, his kids, and the animals that were with him on the ship, God helped them, and they were all right. God has all the bones. God has the strength to rescue. God has the strength to keep all his promises And we've seen that. We've seen what God did at the end of the world in Noah's day. We see how God kept all his promises then. What I want to do with our remaining time is to look at what God will do at the end of the world. We've looked at what he did. Let's look at what he will do. Um, Turn now to the last book of the Bible, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to read chapter 20 in its entirety. And actually, I may read a little past chapter 20. Uh, by the way, this is what I do in the village sometimes. I, I'm trying to translate God's word into the Doe language, then prepare lessons, and then teach those lessons. I need to get those lessons checked to make sure they communicate, and then I need to teach them. And sometimes there's just not enough time. And so what, one thing I've done is Sometimes when I don't have anything else to say, I just open God's word and we just read giant sections of it. And it's really helpful. Now you've kind of heard the context of God at the end of the world. Now just read chapter 20 in light of what we're thinking about. God cursed the serpent and said a descendant of the woman would crush the serpent's head. God promised that. We saw that back in Genesis 3. God cursed the ground because of Adam and since then has made it clear that this world will not, excuse me, will not last forever. We read God's word in Genesis 8 where God says, while the earth remains. And last week, we read God's word in 2 Peter 
where he says, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. And God will not only deal with those who do not believe in him, but he will rescue those who come to him and believe in his son. And we get to see God keep his word in the future in this prophecy in Revelation 20. God has the strength and power to bring all of these things to an end. Let's read Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And I'll pause right there just to say, did you notice the number discrepancy of those judged versus those saved. Satan's going to come out at the end of Jesus' reign here on earth. And he's going to deceive the nations, and he's going to be successful, incredibly successful. Their numbers are like the sands of the seashore. Massive, massive army will come and is going to surround, look what it says, Surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city. That's amazing. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's keep going. 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, look, I am making all things new. In the last day, God is going to keep his promises, all of them. We saw how God cursed the serpent in the ground, and that serpent, the devil, Satan, will be dealt with and will be tormented forever and ever. He just does not win. He will never be released again. This ground, the old heavens and the old earth, will be done away with. Revelation 20, 11 says, the heaven and earth are going to flee from the presence of the one who sits on the throne. They're going to flee and there's going to be nowhere to go. Last week in 2 Peter 3, we read that by the word of the Lord, this world is being kept for fire. And a little bit later, he says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. This world is going to pass away. It's going to go away. It's going to flee, and there's going to be no place for it. In the last day, God will judge mankind. Everyone will be judged according to what they have done. God has books in which are recorded every deed, every thought. Right back in Genesis 6, we saw that the Lord looked out on mankind and saw that every intention of the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. He sees thoughts, attitudes, intentions, and he is going to judge perfectly. I don't know if you've ever thought how embarrassing it would be to have your sins put on display. If you could have your thoughts just written out in front of you for the world to see. It'd be pretty embarrassing. Mine would be horrifying. And God sees all of it and records all of it. No one will get away with anything. No hidden thought, no hidden deed, no secret deal. No one's going to get away because they're wealthy and powerful and they have the means to negotiate with God. No one's going to escape because of their weakness or poverty where God's going to go, oh, fine, I'll let you in. No one escapes by dying. Have you ever thought about that? There have been some pretty evil characters in the world and some of them lived pretty nice lives and then died without any punishment. But death is no escape. Notice who's being judged at the end of chapter 20. It's the dead. Even death is not an escape. There is only one escape from this judgment. In the last day, God will rescue those who believe in his son. In Revelation 26, we read that you are blessed if you are part of the first resurrection, the one that precedes the millennium. You are safe if your name is in the Lamb's book of life. So how can you know if your name is there? If your name is in the Lamb's book of life? Listen to these words of Jesus from John chapter 6. Jesus is speaking to a crowd that really wants Jesus to give them more food. They're, they are very concerned with earthly things. They, they want manna from heaven. They want bread every day. And Jesus turns to them and says, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, you will never be hungry or thirsty again. He is the one who can satisfy your cravings, your thirsts. And Jesus says, this is the will of my Father, John 6, verse 40. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The road to the blessed resurrection is belief in the only Son of God, Jesus Christ. And uh, being born again, being made new, 
being one who trusts in the Lord, these are weighty, wonderful things. Uh, and my, my time is over, but I just want to commend to you, come next week to the equipping hour, Kyle Frazee, if Jesus doesn't come back before then, Kyle Frazee is going to uh, talk about the new birth. How is it that we are born again? All those who trust in the Lord Jesus will have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Not one of them will be lost. Even during the judgment at the white throne, that book, the Lamb's book of life, is going to be opened so that it can be shown that those who are cast into the lake of fire did not have their names written there. All who listen to God's word, who hear a true assessment of their sin, who hear of the rescue that Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross, and who think that's true and follow the Lord Jesus, trusting his word, those people will be safe. Are you one of them? If you are, you are already at peace with God and you will be saved at the wrath to come. Over the second death, over, over us, the second death will have no power because our names will be in the Lamb's book of life. Before the throne of God, we will be able to say, because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and that it's true. Oh God, thank you that it's in our language and we can understand it. But God, oh, how we need new hearts and new minds to believe you. God, we need to repent. We need to turn from our old ways of thinking, thinking that you are just going to forgive everybody. Old thinking like we are good enough to make it. Oh God, help us to replace those feeble, broken thoughts with robust, true ones about who you are. God, I pray that we would trust you as our creator, our savior, and the only judge worth fearing. God, you will be there at the end, and for that we praise you, because you are our only hope. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.